Hi, welcome to the Electronics channel. Uh, today I want to talk about lithium batteries and balancing in particular. So you've got two lithium batteries, you connect them in series, and you want to keep them balanced. How do you do it? Well, the traditional way is with one of these, or a board with some of these on it. As the cells charge up, if one of them gets too high in voltage, connect a resistive load across the cell that's too high, throw away some of the energy, uh, and balance the pack up. Um, that's not great, is it? Throwing away energy seems a bit of a waste. But, new on the scene, recently, devices like this. Inductive charge balancers. So, this is all clever stuff. Um, and the question is, just how is this working? How can we transfer energy from one cell to the other in either direction without losing any energy in a resistor? Um, so what I want to do is have a look at this chip and how it might work. Now, I've got one of these on order from eBay. Uh, one of the sort of uh, three cell, I think it is, pack balancers. Uh, but it hasn't arrived yet, so this is purely a, an upfront speculative look at how we think this thing might work. Now I have a data sheet for this particular example, which is the ETA 3000. Um, I don't know if this is the part that's going to be on the board I'm getting, but I think from what I've seen on Julian's channel and uh, on the internet, this is probably the same chip. Um, so let's have a look at what might be in here and how this might work. So we've got our two cells, we've got the chip, and we've got this inductor. Uh, and to be honest, there's not much else in here. There's a few decoupling caps to keep everything clean. Um, there's a couple of set values for current limiting and an enable pin. So there's not much really here to to get wrong. Um, so what do we think is inside here? So what would a traditional uh, resistive charge balancer look like? So we'd probably have we'd have a charge unit. We have our two cells. I'm going to stay with two cells just to keep the example nice and easy. And then we'd have some device here which would monitor the voltage of the two cells. And if either of them exceeds the voltage limit threshold, which is for, you know, for a lithium polymer, it's typically 4.2 volts, something of that sort of order, then it would turn off the charging. So there might be something like a MOSFET switch in line here, and that would be under the control of this, of this chip here. And the charging would be ceased. Um, at the same time, it will turn on another effect connecting a resistive load across the, the affected cell. So we would effectively try and drain some energy out of the cell that's reached its peak voltage. And then once the cell voltage has dropped down to a safe level again, you can resume charging um, and you can keep that resistive load on there to divert some of the charge current away from that cell because we know that it's nearly full. So that's how it would done, be done with a resistive charger. Uh, so what would be the difference to this new inductive charger? So. So now let's look at the case of the active balancer and see how that differs. So we're going to draw the same setup as we did for the passive balancer. We've got a charger connected to two cells. And then we've got our fabulous clever new Wonder I see here. There's two points, and we've got an inductor here going to one of the pins. Now we know this device operates in a switch mode principle uh, to keep power losses down, and indeed, you know, it's capable in theory, according to the data sheet, of two amps of current out of this uh, balancing node, um, even though this chip is only like little surface mount, maybe 2 by 2 millimeter square part. So the internal dissipation of this chip is very low. 
so we know it must be using a couple of MOSFETs in a switch mode operation. And the most obvious candidate is a half bridge. Configured like so. So if this is switch one and this is switch two. So how can we make this do what we want? So if we've got a battery voltage here, V1 across this cell, and V2 across this cell, and if we call this, let's call this V plus, let's call this V minus, let's call this B for balance, I guess. Seems reasonable. Um, so what can we do here? So let's start by saying I think the switches are probably running as a half bridge where they're always on. So I, when one is on, two is off, and when two is on, one is off. But one of them is always conducting. Um, doesn't have to be the case. I think there are alternate methods of controlling this, but let's assume that's the case for the minute. Uh, it eliminates the worry about the uh, parasitic MOSFET diodes coming into play. It just keeps it easier to explain the principle, I think. Um, so let's just start with a, a hypothesis. So we want the midpoint of the cells, this voltage here, um, to be exactly half this value. In other words, the two cells are equivalent voltages. Um, so if we run these two MOSFETs, let's say 50% duty cycle, and let's plot what that would look like. So you'd be switching V plus V minus like this. And we'll be alternating around an average value, which, well, let's say VB is the average value running through the middle there. Because <coughs> for 50% duty cycle, the average value is obviously right in the middle. Um, so the average value of VB here um, is exactly half of the, the rail voltage. And if the cells are balanced, this point is exactly half the rail voltage. So in fact, from, a, from an average point of view, the two voltages are balanced. There'd be no net DC current in the inductor. So in the, in the condition where the two cells are actually already balanced, no net DC current would flow, there'd be no charge balancing. All we would get is a small amount of ripple current in the inductor caused by the fact that there is voltage, alternating voltage across it. So first V plus minus VB and then VB minus V minus. So there would be some ripple in the inductor. So if I draw this on the same graph, there'd be a current through the inductor that would look something like this. Okay, so on that scale, this is inductor current. Let's call it, let's call it IB. Let's identify that by an arrow here. And it's alternating around an average value of zero, because we're saying everything is balanced at the moment. So, okay, so that's good. In a balanced condition, 50% due to cycle on the switches and everything's happy. What about if the voltage isn't quite balanced at this point? So let's say V2 is slightly lower than V1, so the average voltage at this point is slightly below the 50% level. And that means the voltage here is slightly lower than 50%, there's going to be a net DC current into this node. <coughs> now that's really actually exactly what we need, because we want to contribute current in this direction into this cell, and we want to reduce the current through this cell. And since the total down here is this plus this. If that is positive and that is positive, this is greater. So there's more current into this cell at this point and less into this one because we're adding a correction factor in here. So just by keeping the switches at 50%, the correction is kind of happening automatically. The current is in the right direction to try and pull the voltage back such that these two cells are equal again. Um, and the current through the inductor now has a net positive offset, so there's a DC value through here. So if we plot the inductor current down here, instead of being about zero now, I'm going to assume this ripple is quite small. The inductor current is now going to look something more like this. It's going to have a net value, which is non-zero, 
and positive in this case. So you know, it looks like it's going to do the right thing just by keeping the switches at 50%. Um, the question is, how is charge getting distributed from one to the other? I mean, it's not really clear just from that how energy from one cell can get transferred to the other. And I think to see what's happening there, we have to look at the currents in these two legs. And I'm going to mark them in this direction. And I'm going to say this is I plus and this is I minus. And the reason I'm doing that direction is so I can state that I plus plus I minus, so I minus plus I plus is equal to IB. Now, since these switches are operating on a duty cycle, obviously only one path is present at any one time. But from an average point of view, this statement holds true. <coughs> um, well, in fact, from an instantaneous point of view, it holds true as well. But only one of these currents will be operating at any one time. So let's see what... So this was IB, which has a net positive value. Let's have a look what I plus is doing and I minus are doing. So I plus, I plus carries the current IB whenever the top switch is on. The bottom switch is off, so I minus is zero. So for this phase here, I'll just check this line down. Doesn't quite line up, but there we go. So I minus is zero in this phase. And I plus is equal to IB because the top switch is on. So I plus is equal to IB, which is that, just transferred down. And then we switch sides, FET2 comes on and IB is equal to I minus now. And I plus is zero, so that's zero. So now the current in IB is flowing in I minus and then it swatches over and that's zero. So this then comes back into play, ramps up again, and so on. So that's what I plus and I minus are going to look like when there's a small imbalance. Okay, so now if we look at the currents in I plus and I minus, so I plus here is, is positive, so the current is the same direction as the arrow, it's going through VB. So the current in this loop is in this direction. Now we said that this cell had the higher voltage and this one had the lower voltage. And you can see that the direction of that current is effectively out of that cell. So energy is being taken out of that cell at a rate of current which is the average of this. And then if we look at this loop down the bottom, which is the I minus loop, again it's positive with respect to how we defined it here. The current in this loop is this direction. So in this cell, it's going into the cell to charge it up. So this cell is being discharged, this cell is being charged, charge is being transferred from one to the other. So it's exactly what we, we want, it's exactly what the principle of this inductive cell balancing is, and that's essentially how it's working to transfer charge from one to the other. It relies on this inductor storing energy, and then it being transferred from one rail to the other, effectively. But there is a problem with this scheme, as I've drawn it here. We can't just turn the switches on at 50% and everything will be honky-dory. It does work, and we've shown that it does work here. However, there's no limit on the current. So if the cell charge, sorry, the cell voltage were sufficiently imbalanced, then there's nothing to limit the amount of current that will be flowing through this system. So, you know, we have a little bit of parasitic resistance in the inductor there, which is pretty much the only limiting element and the RDS on of these FETs as well. Um, but you know, this, could, this current could get very high because the scale of these resistances is very low in the scheme of the circuit. So you know, if these cells were half a volt different and the resistance of this inductor was 0.1 ohms, then we'd have five amps. You know, so you know, we're in trouble. So how can we keep the current in check in this system? Well, I suspect um, and I would say I haven't had my hands on one of these to check it yet. Uh, and the data sheet doesn't really, give me, doesn't really give me any clues on this. But I suspect they just modulate the PWM duty cycle such that the average voltage VB becomes closer 
to the voltage on the midpoint of the two cells here. So in other words, if there's no difference in average voltage here and here, then obviously there's no net current. So by modulating the duty cycle, you can control the current from zero, positive or negative, by modulating this value. Now we know that it's automatically trying to go in the right direction if you keep it at 50%, but you could always modify that according to the current you measure coming out of the chip. So I think what's happening here is the, the output current is being measured. In fact, internally, it's probably the current through the two MOSFETs that's being monitored. Uh, and then they're recombining that to make the current through the inductor. Um, and they're using that to modify the PVM and limit the current that way. So it'd be interesting to see when we get our hands on the actual device what it's actually doing under these circumstances. But I, I suspect that's what's going on. But anyway, the principle of the redistribution of the charge from one side to the other um, has been shown. So yeah, it's cool. It's a good chip. So yeah, I think that's basically how it works. Um, principle looks good. Looks like they've done a good job with implementation. But we'll find out when we actually receive the part and give it a try. Um, Thanks for watching, hope you like this. Um, if you want more content like this, make some comments below. If you've got any questions about this or something I'm not explaining very well, because it is my first video, uh, just let me know and I'll try and explain it better. Uh, yeah, thanks for watching and see you on the next one. Bye bye for now.